When I was a kid staying up in the Stevenson house, there was a framed photograph of John Boyden sitting on the porch, leaning back in his wooden chair, um, reading a magazine, um, leaning against the wall, and under his chair is his dog, Joe, um, sitting very precariously if the chair fell because it's leaning way back. Because John has his feet up on the top of the back of another chair, and uh, he's got the hat down over his eyes, uh, a boater, and a pipe in his mouth, and you can see he's got a kind of good-sized mustache. Um, anyway, lovely picture, and always interested in who that guy was. And Uncle Bert, Bert Boyden, who our generation always calls Uncle Bert, uh, wrote about him. He said, In my early days in Tamworth, before John Boyden came on board, I recall Henry Wallace as the working head of farm operations, a tall, lean, tough, intense character who never seemed to tire. He and his family lived in the old part of the Stevenson house, the family including a little, brown, pretty, barefooted Agnes, now Mrs. Walter Taylor, the Taylors being our valued neighbors and good friends of today. As far as barefootedness is concerned, that was true of all the children about the place and was reckoned by us to be one of Tamworth's delightful privileges, though it meant an occasional stone bruise or so to sore toe and a good deal of scratchy walking in the stubble of new-cut hayfields. I remember once when Cousin Augusta told Hen, as he was always called, that she was going down country for a visit he replied in language that came from his livestock, That's right, Gusty. Go along. Have a good kick up. Incidentally, it may be well to add that the dignified appellative Cousin Augusta was known only to the young fry, to all of the household above that status, and across the wide countryside she was universally known in friendly but always respectful fashion as Gusty. After Hen Wallace's day, John Boyden was manager of the farm. But by that time, Western farm products had superseded much that previously had been raised advantageously in New England, and our Stevenson place had become almost a non-entity as a farm. Cousin Augusta was under no illusion as to the state of things. Her cattle found scanty feed among the rocks and were far from prize stock in appearance. One late afternoon, as they were trailing homeward from pasture, I asked her, What has become of that red cow? To which she replied, John sold that cow, and I don't know why either. She was the best cow we had, adding. I mean, she looked the most like a cow of anything on the place. For a number of years after John St Uncle John Stevenson's day, there was, as far as my memory is concerned, something of an interregnum, Doubtless that was when Hen Wallace was at the helm. Then John, Uncle, then John Boyden appeared on the scene, retiring from commercial life to pass the remainder of his days among the mountains, brooks, and woods, which, with the farm life and his dog, he had found meant more to him than anything else the world could offer him. He was born in 1851 and passed the year 1870-71 at Bodoin College, but did not continue there. This is all I know about his college career, beyond the fact that there was on a mantle in the Stevenson house a silver cup which he won in the college regatta held on the Androscoggin River, October 13, 1870, taking second prize in the one-mile Huery race. His brief stay there and his rowing prize were both characteristic, for though he was physically strong, hardy, and enduring, capable of great effort, his disposition was inconstant, subject to change without notice, and it is likely that he left Bodwin in some trifling mood of dissatisfaction. Afterward, he worked in Boston, Chicago, Sheffield, Illinois, 
and North Platte, Nebraska. But I think it was not until he daffed the world aside and betook himself to the Stevenson hillside, living there pretty much without concern, that he found content. He rarely left his house after that, though he was once Tamworth's representative to the state legislature at Concord. And when his talk ran excitedly upon the Boston and Maine Railroad's control of that legislature, he was worth going miles to hear. Occasionally, he came down to Beverly in Boston to buy clothes. And once in his latter years, he visited New York, but by that time, the haste and din of the metropolis were too much for him. I got the impression that he had, it really terrified him. And he was relieved when he found himself once more on the porch of the Stevenson house with his happy valley and his mountain before his eyes. He had a superior mind, quick and sharp in action, but full of odd and picturesque vagaries, was widely read in good literature, possessed an exceptional memory, and a happy knack in respect to both the spoken and written word. These qualities, with a great liking for friends and talk, made him a conspicuous feature of our Tamworth life during his era. An ungovernable temper, however, occasionally fast flashed forth, often almost irrationally, marring his career and being perhaps the cause of his rovings. But these outbreaks were rare, and most of us knew them only by hearsay. For myself, I asked no better friend and company than John. My long friendship with him had its best roots in the year when it was thought that my health would be bettered by a term in the open air, so I, willing enough, went off to Tamworth in the early spring and was the sole visitor there until others flocked in for the summer. John and I were constant companions during this period, working, reading, talking, and fishing, the latter enterprise taking us most frequently to the upper waters of the Dural Brook on Chicawa Mountain. I remember being disconcerted once in this, in this fashion. I had, of course, picked up from John some trifles of wisdom about country life, among them the adage that cows lying down in the forenoon are a sign of rain. So once, when our region was praying for water, I said, John, I guess we're going to get rain now, for the cows are all lying down in the forenoon. But John thought not, confronting me with another adage, altogether contradictory and equally valid, to the effect that all signs fail in a dry time. There came no rain, and I said to myself, what's the use of learning anything? Once in a day of blazing, fiery heat, there came a sudden and wild thunderstorm, accompanied by a ripping and tearing blast of wind, full of hailstones, some of them coming down in chunks of ice as big as marbles, which took seventy-four panes of glass out of the west end of the Stevenson house and thirty-seven out of the Harris house, precipitating us abruptly from almost unbearable heat to overcoats and snow shovels. John told me of a similar experience of his on the North Platte, where the thermometer fell 54 degrees in nine minutes. And after what I had just seen, I hadn't the slightest difficulty in believing him. Cousin John delighted in argument, and I reckon he often took the wrong side just to make sure there would be an argument. Many of the alleged facts and reasons he introduced were comical enough, for he didn't care what he said when he got well under way. He said once that no Boyden was ever known to undertake manual labor, adding sententiously, that's the reason all Boydens have such short arms. It is very likely a fact that the Boydens haven't hankered much for let manual labor, but none of us had ever heard of their short arms before, nor had John. Grandfather Wyatt Boyden married twice and had children by each wife, one a Woodbury, the other a Lincoln. John declared that the Lincoln Boydens had always looked down on the Woodbury Boydens, a preposterous statement as there was hardly a consciousness in the family that there ever were two branches. I imagine John was merely trying to start something. He and I were once passing the night up on Passaconway Mountain. It was late in the year, and we were sopping wet to the knees from tramping in the snow. 
After we had built our fire for the night and had eaten our snack, John rolled up in his blanket, pointed his feet to the fire, and apparently was ready for slumber. I exclaimed in amazement, John, don't you propose to dry out your shoes and socks? He replied from his blanket, No, that would be the surest way to catch cold. In the morning, our leftover coffee was frozen solid in the dippers, but John gave no sign of inconvenience. That noon we had a lunch, which I remember as one of the most delicious I ever ate. It consisted of two hard-boiled eggs apiece, devoured as we walked over Whiteface Peak in a snowstorm driven by fierce mountain winds, the air so cold that each egg had ice in the void space at its end. I re rejoice in recalling a few of his entertaining remarks, which chance has retained in memory, though time cast something of a chill upon them, and they now lack the light of the moment. He should have had a Boswell. A friend of John's, call him Squire Lee, was thought to overvalue himself and his accomplishments, and was quite ingenuous in making public his own estimate of himself. When Cousin Augusta received a birthday letter in which praise and congratulation were laid on thick, she, mightily pleased, passed it on to John, who, after reading, handed it back, saying tartly, Sounds like a letter from Squire Lee to himself. He often declared that we small boys would go to any amount of effort to play, in play, half kill ourselves indeed, but if we discovered that our struggles were of use or help to anybody, all the fun went out of it and it became work, and really there was a degree of truth in it. In climactic, climatic contrast with our snow adventure above mentioned, was a climb up the north slide of Passaconway Mountain, which took place on literally the hottest day of the summer, the bare rock almost burning to the touch. I think it was John's last venture into the mountains, and before we reached the top of the slide I began to be fearful that he might never get there, but he finally did win the height. Nearby was shade and an ice-cold mountain spring, and John plunged his head into the water clear to his shoulders four or five times, then sank back in the shade, murmuring feebly, Bert, when I reached the top of that slide, I was absolutely bankrupt in mind, body, and estate. On a previous fishing jaunt, he and I were traveling rapidly down Chicago Mountain when John, who was in high spirits and had been singing the Marseillaise at the top of his voice, tripped over a root and fell headlong down the path. Not at all hurt, but a good deal chagrined, he brushed off the sticks and leaves with the observation, Pronus Magister Volviter in Caput, straight from Virgil. John being about the only person of my acquaintance whose reaction to such a tumble might take the form of such a quotation. I think it was on this same trip, Mrs. Shackford having provided a lunch for us, we were sitting by the brookside eating it when John remarked indignantly, Bert, these donuts are so dry a man couldn't eat one with his head under water, and he hurled the offending donut off into the woods for mice and squirrels. He was accustomed to say that there seemed to be two classes of people in the world, those out of Tamworth who wanted to get in, and those in Tamworth who wanted to get out. Once, when luck went against him, he quoted with mock bitterness from Byron, The worm, the canker, and the grief are mine. While driving by the parson hidden ordination rock, earlier mentioned with someone new to the neighborhood, the latter asked the significance of the marble shaft, and John, without raising an eyebrow, said, The monument commemorates the scene of a great battle with the Indians and is always known as Massacre Rock. On this same ride, the newcomer made inquiry about a long scar on Paugus Mountain caused by a rock slide, and John benignantly informed him that it is a piece of the old stage road over Paugus, very little used nowadays. He and some neighbors were planning a fishing trip into the mountains, and one of them innocently asked, Where would we better start from? John's suggestion was, 
I guess we'd better walk over to Birch Intervale and start from there. That, that will save us about four miles. I am told the inquirer wouldn't speak to him during the whole trip. Again, he and Mary were watching a litter of tiny pigs running around in the open, squeaking shrilly, full of life and joy. She said, aren't they cute? And John replied, they certainly are. The only trouble with them is that they will make hogs of themselves. He and I were once at a pop concert in Boston, music of that order being one of his great delights. After a long interval of listening, he turned to me and asked earnestly, what is it about playing the bass viol that takes all the expression out of a man's face? If you take occasion to watch the countenance of a bass viol player, you will perceive the pertinence of John's query. He had a dog, Joe, who was dearer to him than life, his companion by day and by night. Joe had been teased and plagued a good deal and got into the way of biting people upon the slightest provocation, and sometimes, as it seemed, upon no provocation at all. After one of his biting forays, Stuart Webb asked, John, why don't you kill that dog? John, at white heat, turned on him and said fiercely, Why doesn't your mother kill you? There was a pale, thin little girl about the place, a waif who was for the time being a member of the family. She had so far outgrown her clothes that one cold, bitter day, John said indignantly, Gusty, why don't you get that child some dresses that are long enough for her? Her legs look like icicles. When Mr. and Mrs. Grover Cleveland came to Tamworth for the first time, they made a call at the Stevenson house. Cousin Augusta was on hand and received them with regal dignity. But John was in the barn at work, perhaps milking. He had long been a proud and uncompromising Cleveland Democrat, Grover Cleveland being his idol in public life. Being summoned from the barn, he came in, unknowing that he was to meet the great ex-president and the wife who had so long been, officially and otherwise, the first lady. He was equal to the occasion, however, carrying on with ease and dignity. Afterward, he said, The greatest thing I ever did in my life was to rise above those barn clothes of mine to meet Mr. and Mrs. Cleveland. As time went on, he and Mr. Cleveland became good friends and had many a bout over a little cribbage board, handmade, I think, by John himself. And there you have it. John Borden.